say they had no warning. We do have a, a tornado siren here, and from my, I was here right after it hit, and there was no sound whatsoever. And the, the tornado siren never went out to alert these people. We had no warning that it was a tornado up until that time. Any sirens at all? No, no sirens, nothing. Do you feel like these people had any chance to get out? None whatsoever. Whisked away in a flash by the forces of nature, the twisters of 1990. Yes, it's more than flattened. This is shredded. The houses are shredded. Nine people found uh, in an apartment complex in Crest Hill. You went over it earlier. We'll see it again. There were a lot of people around it. Uh, they were blown from the building. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. This is Blaze back here. Today we are talking about a tornado event infamous for being one of the most horrific and unnecessary tragedies in the weather enterprise. The events of August 28th, 1990 will forever solidify in history as what the worst case scenario is when the weather enterprise makes a mistake. The Plainfield tornado is the first violent tornado to ever be recorded in the month of August since tornado records began in 1990. And it remains as the only F5 or EF5 rated tornado to have ever occurred in the month of August. One of the many eerie and mysterious things about this event is that there are no known photos or videos of the actual tornado. What we do have, however, our reanalysis of the meteorological data, surveys conducted by Dr. Ted Fujita himself, we have investigations, and we also have lawsuits to go through. So with all that being said, let's get right into it. This is the August 1990 Plainfield Tornado. Plainfield is a town in Northeastern Illinois. And as many of you know, Illinois has a pretty extensive history with tornadoes. In fact, Illinois has seen some of the most infamous tornadoes in recorded history. The Tri-State Tornado, of course, the 1967 Black Friday Tornado outbreak, and the Lakin Tornado. Illinois sees plenty of tornadoes. It is not that uncommon. What is odd, however, are tornadoes in August. So violent August tornadoes are exceedingly rare, but that's what we're talking about today. So, of course, let's take a look at the meteorology behind this anomalous event. In the days leading up to Chicago Metro's most violent tornado in history, an upper-level shortwave trough is moving through the Great Lakes. Behind that, a cold front is advancing. Alongside that, considering that it's August, temperatures at the surface levels are, of course, going to be really high. So in the most basic sense, you can already see how this can set up for a volatile atmosphere. We have an incredibly hot surface. We also have a lot of cooler air in the mid and upper levels moving through. So when we talk about the basic elements needed for severe weather or tornadoes, we always talk about the following. Moisture, instability, a source of lifting, and wind shear. So given the heat of the August temperatures, we already have that instability, the cape that would be needed. And considering that a cold front is advancing with cooler, drier air behind it, we also have our source of lift. We have two of the four needed main ingredients. So what about those other missing ingredients? This is where it gets a little tricky. Despite this particular system having a pretty good kinematic setup, the winds in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere 
are supportive of tornadoes. The lower level shear was notably lacking, and this is a key element in the formation of tornadoes. Without that lower level wind shear, tornadoes were not initially a concern for this event. So seeing this data coming in, the forecasters are not concerned about a tornado threat in northern Illinois at this time. So now it's August 27th, the day before the Plainfield tornado. Seeing all the elements come together, forecasters have already anticipated that severe weather is going to be possible, just not tornadoes. They're expecting a derecho type of event or a big windbag, basically. So with that, forecasters at the Chicago offices issue a slight risk of severe weather for August 28th, the next day. The interesting thing to me about this is that the really only missing element here is the lower level wind shear. It seems like a very fine line to balance to me. Should the lower level wind shear pick up, as it would, and we will see that happen, now we have a tornado threat on the table. There's an explosive amount of energy. Seems like considering that line is so fine, they would make a, a sort of margin for should the lower level wind shear pick up, we're going to be on alert, be ready for supercell thunderstorms should this happen. But I digress. August 28th, 1990, the day of the Plainfield tornado. By early morning hours, it's already very hot it's sticky outside. And as the morning progresses, as the temperature and dew points rise, so does the instability. In fact, the temperatures and dew points were pretty exceptional. Temperatures were in the low 90s by late afternoon with dew points in the upper 70s. The Cape values were in excess of 7,000 joules per kilogram. <laughs> 7,000. By 10 o'clock a.m., the NSSFC in Kansas City, Missouri, decided to upgrade their severe weather outlook from a slight risk to a moderate risk. They upgraded this risk again just because of the anticipation for intense wind damage, a derecho type of event, but something is about to happen that would change the entire event. It's now noon in northern Illinois. Storms are rapidly developing along the cold front in Wisconsin and northern central Illinois. The forecasting center, the Chicago forecasting office, decides to issue a severe thunderstorm watch. But here's where things get interesting. As the forecasters are issuing that severe thunderstorm watch, Afternoon balloon launches are done to collect the data in the atmosphere to see where everything's at and to get an update. The atmosphere was changing rapidly. We already know that the thermodynamics were there, the cape was explosive, but here's what's important. The reanalysis reveals that the upper and mid-level wind jet streaks were shifting. A change in wind direction with height. That's the wind shear, the missing element. So now there was enough low level shear for tornadoes. All the ingredients are present now. Tornadoes are possible. This is a critical point in the story. The forecasters are seeing the change in the environment, but decide that the tornado threat, should it materialize, is too low and too isolated of an area. So the forecast office decides to go ahead and issue this severe thunderstorm watch. There is no mention of tornadoes. The storm system is now approaching Rockford in Northern Illinois and a dominant storm cell is beginning to emerge. The storm very quickly reaches heights over 65,000 feet and is displaying classic supercellular structure. 
This dominant cell now moves into DeKalb and Kane counties, where it brings strong damaging winds and tennis ball sized hail. It's already a really wicked storm. This supercell is very quickly becoming tornadic. It's at this point, just after 1.30, a few minutes after that severe thunderstorm watch has been issued, that multiple funnel sightings, large hail, and damaging winds are all happening just south of Rockford in association with this storm. But it's clear that this cell is ramping up to do something really awful. It's just a matter of when and where. The first tornado touchdown from this cell of the day would happen just to the west of Rockford at 1.42 p.m., just a few minutes after that initial severe thunderstorm watch was issued. The cell continues southwest towards Aurora, producing in total four short-lived predecessor tornadoes in Kane County between 2.45 p.m. and 3.15 p.m. And while we note that these preceding initial tornado touchdowns weren't noteworthy in the sense that they caused damage, they were noteworthy because they indicated a pattern of behavior. By that logic, seeing the signs of the storm rotating or producing hook echoes, we would assume that the forecasters would issue another watch to include the mention of tornadoes or something to that effect to inform the public in some capacity that tornadoes are possible. None of that happened. Minutes later, this same supercell that's dropped four brief tornadoes would go on to produce one of the most violent and devastating tornadoes in Illinois state history. The Plainfield tornado has just touched down. Okay, we've got... The tornado touches down at 3.30 p.m. near Oswego in Kendall County. The tornado would continue to track parallel with Highway 30 for roughly four miles at F1 intensity, briefly getting up to F2 damage in just the first few minutes. It feels like this entire event for days and this entire morning, the momentum has really been building. This single supercell, this one tornado, is ready to produce an extremely violent tornado very quickly. And that's exactly what's about to happen. Good lord, this shit is wild. There's a clear to be a tornado. Just a few minutes after touching down, this tornado is approaching the first populated areas in Wheatland Plains. This would be the first subdivision that takes a direct hit and also the first area of major damage sustained. It's here in this first subdivision in Wheatland Plains where 12 families would lose their homes. Their homes were completely destroyed and 50 more families would have their homes damaged in some capacity. Unfortunately, the Wheatland Plains subdivision is also where the first injuries would occur and where the tornado would also claim its first victim. And that brings us to the most critical part of this event. Where's the tornado warning? At this point, the people in Northern Illinois have gotten a severe thunderstorm watch. That's it. There's been no mention of a tornado at this point. After raking over Wheatland Plains, the tornado only continues to grow stronger and larger. And now, unfortunately, showing no signs of slowing down or weakening, the tornado is now rapidly approaching the town of Plainfield. And they have no idea. Plainfield is in trouble.
It's here after crossing over into Will County that the tornado very quickly intensifies to F5 intensity in just a few seconds. A 20 ton tractor trailer truck is picked up and thrown almost half a mile away. And this wasn't the only car death. It's also here that two massive steel transmission towers would be bent and crumpled, completely destroyed. And it's just a very powerful display of the intensity of this storm already in just the first few minutes of being on the ground. After crossing the highway and taking several more lives, the tornado weakens just barely. It's now high end F4 intensity as it's now moving directly into the town of Plainfield. And if you're wondering where the tornado warning is, I have not missed it. There is still no tornado warning. Plainfield is completely unsuspecting that a violent tornado is headed right towards them. As the tornado now enters town, it's immediately obliterating everything in its path. We're talking high-end F3 to F4 intensity damage, well-built structures, completely flattened. The next area in the path is the Plainfield High School. The Plainfield High School, the school was out, so it wasn't a full school. However, there were still people there. The girls volleyball team is practicing in the gym for a match. Boys high school football team is also practicing. The high school football team was practicing nearby and made its way into the school just in time. And all of a sudden our ears started popping. And then we heard big crashes and we all jumped into the corners of the high school and uh, the roof was shaking up and down and a big hole got in the roof. And as soon as they came out, the whole gym was gone. I thought we were gonna die. Tragically, one science teacher and two maintenance workers who were in the building in different parts were killed, and this is at F3 intensity. Uh, just across the street, uh, what you're looking at now is you're looking in the direction of Plainfield High School. Up in that tree, there is a, a dumpster that has been lodged by the force of the wind on the top of that, of that broken off tree. It's just, it's just embedded there. Shortly after the high school takes a hit, the St. Mary Immaculate Church takes a direct hit, and yet another fatality occurs here. Among the hardest hit, the St. Mary's Church and School, the steel parish steeple is twisted and dangling. Members of the St. Mary Immaculate Church and School are grieving the loss of three of their own today. The tornado killed their principal, Sister Mary Keenan, while she was getting ready for classes to begin. There was some people trapped in, inside the church. We took a, some bricks and stuff off of some people and found some things we shouldn't have and or didn't want to. Yeah, some severely injured people and a couple of fatalities. The tornado is continuing through Plainfield, completely unwarned. Southeast of the F3 damage that's just been happening to the schools and the main parts of Plainfield, the tornado once again re-intensifies. The Lily Cash subdivision takes a hit at F4 intensity. Next in line is Crystal Lawns. Once again, homes are blown off their foundations. A lot of people are being injured in this time, even outside of the fatalities. Given that they are completely unsuspecting of something happening, they are either outside in a car, they're in their home in a very open area, they might be by a window just doing their normal daily things. It's at this point at 3.45 p.m., 15 minutes after the tornado has been raking over Plainfield, a call is made to the weather service office reporting a tornado touchdown. And notably, this call is from emergency services to the weather office to confirm a tornado touchdown. And 
for whatever reason, there was still no warning. For several minutes after this call was made, there was still no tornado warning. And now the Plainfield tornado is on its final stretch. The final areas of intense to violent damage would occur near the Crest Hill and Crest Hill Lake apartment buildings. The Crest Hill Lake apartment complex had high-end F3 damage. However, the fatalities and injuries here were bad. Eight more people would be killed here. Again, most of which were not found in the apartment complex. They were found a ways away. Two more people were killed at Warwick Estates while the tornado was at high-end F2 to F3 intensity. Three more apartment buildings were destroyed as well. Some of those who died, died here amidst the destruction. But most searchers say ended up here in an adjacent cornfield. That's where most of them were found. Children most or adults? Or both? Uh, were they blown, sure, from, 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 the blown, blown from the apartment? Blown from the apartment, as far as we can tell, yeah. Uh, well, right now we're uh, tearing apart the building, uh, making sure that there's no more uh, people inside. Every time you move a piece of debris, you just pray that there's not anybody underneath there. It's just too, uh, too unbelievable. And finally, after a horrific display of violence, the tornado is showing signs of dying out. The fateful twister uses its remaining strength to move through Joliet before taking its final breath and dissipating. And with that, as the tornado moves out of Plainfield, it dissipates and it's finally over. And at 3.51 p.m., after the Plainfield tornado has killed dozens and injured hundreds of people, the Weather Service issues the first tornado warning of the day. counted more than 100 individual family homes that have been destroyed in Plainfield in the area surrounding the high school, as well as a 42-unit apartment complex had the roof removed from it, and all of those people are without homes right now. We have had a report of nine people blown out of a, an apartment complex uh, found in a cornfield in Crestview, Crest Hill. The death toll, perhaps the highest here than anywhere in the region, as many as 10 people, perhaps 11 now, uh, reported dead in this complex. I say perhaps 11. We learned a short while ago of a four-month-old baby whose body was found in a cornfield just a uh, hundred yards from here or so. But we're not sure if she was the 10th uh, victim or perhaps the 11th. All right, what can you tell me about the search? Uh, what have they found? Who have they found? Well, basically, they found uh, six or seven uh, persons who were dead on arrival after they pulled them out of the wreckage. Uh, they were, there were some reports and some indications that there were a lot of a few infants and children that were missing uh, from uh, complaining parents. So the parents say they simply can't account for their children? Uh, correct. The agonizing wait as the uh, crews go in, and they have to be careful. Obviously, these uh, uh, buildings are not in the best of shape. It's a dangerous job. All right, let's talk about the damage and the fatalities. The damage was, of course, very widespread. People were shocked. It likely took them some time to process what has just happened to them. And you realize that this not only has happened to you or not only to your neighborhood or your street, it's happened to your entire town. The scene in some ways resembled old newsreel footage of an Allied bombing raid during World War II. Homes ripped off their foundation, roofs and debris scattered everywhere, cars and even trucks tossed about like matchsticks, and there seemed no end to the destruction. At times, when we surveyed the damage, we could not help but wonder the horror that some of the people on the ground must feel. Loved ones, dead or injured, their homes ruined, and cherished belongings gone forever. 
the rest of the night in Plainfield would be spent digging through rubble, assessing the damage, counting for people who were missing, counting for people who were alive. The entire night, people are just scrambling to figure out what's going on and if their if their loved ones and their friends are okay. Search crews are focusing on the Plainfield High School, working feverishly to break through the rubble that once was that high school gymnasium. Already tonight, they pulled the body of one teacher out. They also, just a few moments ago, pulled the body out of a janitor. This is school. They, as the commander just said, they didn't have a chance at all to get out. It, it hit so suddenly, and the, the tornado siren never went out to alert these people. We recovered one body in the, in the hallway, and we feel possibly there may be another one in there. You just a moment ago brought dogs in. I was, I, somebody told me, is, are you hoping to find a, some sort of a clue that way? Yes, we're trying everything we can try right now. You have no idea where in the school the two victims were when the, sto when the tornado hit? We, we do not. We, the uh, initial victim we came over on, he was, they told us what room he was supposed to be in, and we found him nearby that room, but not in the room. Do you feel like these people had any chance to get out? None whatsoever. And in the coming weeks, the people in Plainfield are doing the best they can to just find their belongings, clean up their homes the best they can, get anything they can out of it, and find a place to stay. In total, 29 people were killed in the Plainfield tornado. 27 of those were that same day, uh, but there were a few who would later succumb to their injuries, and in addition to the 29 total fatalities, 350 people were injured. In total, 470 homes were destroyed, and over a thousand were damaged. The damage totals would ultimately amount to roughly $160 million by 1990 standards, and counting for inflation increase, that's roughly 350 million dollars today. The survey of this tornado was actually done by Dr. Ted Fujita himself and another man named Mr. Dwayne Steigler. In total, the Plainfield tornado would track a total of 16.4 miles and they also note the preceding tornadoes before it, there's four of them, so the Plainfield tornado itself is indicated by the number five on the map. Okay, so let's talk about the tornado warning, or lack thereof. It was over in minutes. To those who experienced it, it was like hours. The kitchen went in and the bedroom, and we was in the living room watching TV. Then it went out and we just went on the floor. I just got on the floor. And everything started flying past the window, and I stayed down until it was over. Victims say they had no warning. We do have a, a tornado siren here, and from my, I was here right after it hit, and there was no sound whatsoever. Any sirens at all? No, no sirens, nothing. As one would imagine, almost immediately after the tornado, people are starting to question why there was no tornado warning. In the coming days, backlash started to pour in. People are asking questions. Journalists are picking up on this. News outlets are picking up on this. Um, people wanted answers. As we mentioned earlier, the tornado warning for Plainfield was issued 20 minutes after Plainfield was hit. Why? Um, there must have been a major problem at the weather office, right? Uh, not necessarily, and let's talk about why. One of the first of many articles that came out was just a few days later. In this article, days later, we have Fred Ostby, the director of the National Severe Storm Forecast Center in Kansas City, Missouri, saying that the weather service is going to conduct an internal investigation. All right, so after this preliminary investigation of the forecasters, they come back and say that after reviewing the actions, they could not find anything that would have shown that they needed a more urgent alert than a severe thunderstorm warning that was issued just before the tornado struck. He says, and I, I quote, the one fly in the ointment is that the tornado produced was a major and violent one, end quote. 
they felt as though they did a satisfactory job given all the information that they had at the time. This was the initial response of the forecast office. So these sort of questions um, would only continue in the coming months. In fact, a slew of articles and questions start coming out in the coming months of the efficacy of this specific office. Uh, and this was a very dark time for the community. Not only is there a whole community in shambles, there's people dead. Um, this was a massive multifaceted failure and it exposed cracks in the weather enterprise. It would take some time, but eventually a lot of the questions would be answered. And that's because in the next six plus months, the National Weather Service actually launched a very thorough investigation of the internal affairs of the August 28th incident. And it would reveal a lot about that day. So let's talk about the ultimate findings of this report. Although the severe thunderstorm moving across northeastern Illinois displayed supercell characteristics, staff at the center chose not to reissue this watch to include the threat of tornadoes. The reason was that the storm was isolated and the tornado threat being well covered by the local warnings issued at Rockford. The office in Rockford received several timely reports of a funnel cloud tornado touchdown and other associated severe weather from the Illinois State Police, which helped them confirm the nature of the storm's threat, end quote. The office in Rockford receives a call about the tornado touchdown. They understand that it's from the police, that it's capable of producing a lot of damage, and it's a tornado on the ground. As the storm moved into the warning area of the Weather Service Forecast Office in Chicago, the weather services provided were suddenly not as timely or accurate as they might have been. The large hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes in southwestern Kane, northwestern Kendall, and western Will counties occurred essentially without warnings of any type in effect. The final part here says limited flow of information in northeastern Illinois prior to and during the severe thunderstorm event, coupled with the failure of radar operators and forecasters to recognize the severe nature of the long lived supercell thunderstorm, indicates that training and preparedness activities and severe weather program oversight had not been implemented effectively at Chicago during the recent years. That's it. It was a failure. It was a failure of recognition. It was a failure on forecasters and it was a failure of communication. It was a multifaceted failure at the worst possible time in the worst possible way. It doesn't get much worse than that. It really doesn't. As they always do, the National Weather Service includes a, a list of recommendations. They always do this. Uh, most of these recommendations consist of improvements in communication first and foremost between the offices, which was um, one of the bigger failures, the lack of communication. There's a whole series of things that they decided to do. So the initial sort of responses that were given by employees of the National Weather Service at the time, that was a lot different from the findings that we just read. The initial response was that there's nothing we could find that would have meant, you know, we could have done anything better. Um, but then to have this report come out, not even a year later to say, this was a complete failure and we will do better and here are the recommendations to do better. Uh, that says a lot to me right there. This investigation wasn't the only one done. Ultimately, in the coming years, a massive lawsuit was actually filed in federal court that charged the National Weather Service with 
the failure to warn residents in the path and sought nearly $75 million in damages. This was filed on behalf of 14 individuals, 12 of which were deceased and two of which were severely injured. And this suit claims negligence. I'm also going to take a second here to say everything we're talking about here are allegations. Six separate complaints were filed under the Federal Tort Claims Act against the defendant seeking recovery for damage and losses. Each complaint alleges that the National Weather Service was negligent in its forecasting and in its issuance of warnings and that the defendant's agents and employees, quote, failed to issue timely and adequate tornado warnings to local law enforcement and emergency personnel, which resulted in the failure of local officials to activate warning sirens, end quote. The Illinois court repeatedly has upheld that when a governmental instruction acts for the benefit of the general public, it owes no duty to a particular member of the public. Ultimately, the matters and the lawsuit were dismissed entirely, which is quite the unsatisfying end for pretty much everybody involved. I want you all to form your own opinions on the lawsuit and generally about everything that's happened. It leaves you almost with a sense of no justice. There are 29 victims and hundreds of people who were injured, lost family members, had this trauma happen to them, and they always are going to have to live with the question of whether or not something could have been done had they had a tornado warning. Hello, um, this is Editing Carly. Uh, so I thought I was done filming, but in the midst of editing this video, I watched some of the news clips for the first time. And when I say they got me really worked up, they got me upset to the point of feeling like I needed to film this extra part um, just to add commentary to. So that's what we're going to do. It's a very simple context we're looking at here. A violent tornado has just gone through Plainfield with zero, no tornado watch and no tornado warning. A tornado warning did come across our newswire here at Channel 2 at 3.51 from the National Weather Service. But that was some six minutes after the fact. A spotter had seen it hit the Crest Hill area at about 3.45 this afternoon. Then that brings about a difficult question. Did the National Weather Service fumble a ball on this one? Yes. And I think not, not uh, at all in this particular situation. They are in a very difficult position. It's unfortunate, but that's what happened today. I, I would agree. I was watching it. I'm, I'm not in the weather business myself, but it was enough information was there so that I came in I was over by, with you gentlemen by the weather wires. I was able to put two and two together to say, look, we have the potential here. Let's just watch it closely. And while we were still watching the red and the yellow coloring on the radar, then it developed and hit very fast, like three or four tornadoes just dropped down and, and then took it. Okay, I'm going to stop that right there. Um, that's a lot to unpack. This second news anchor starts off by saying, I have no understanding of meteorology. We know. His next statement is that, while well, I was in the news station watching the radar live happen and I'm watching these colors and, you know, I'm starting to put two and two together. I see the evidence that's happening and I'm putting two and two together. You are sitting in a newsroom watching a radar with meteorologists, with professionals who do understand these things and maybe talking with them and you're watching this unfold. In what world do you expect the average person in 1990 to put two and two together to understand that a tornado is about to happen? That is really strange to me that he would even say that. And while we were still watching the red and the yellow coloring on the radar, then it developed and hit very fast, like three or four tornadoes just dropped down and, and then took it. And then the next thing he says is that four tornadoes immediately dropped down all of a sudden like this. That's simply not true. This supercell produced multiple predecessor tornadoes over an hour in, in a span of over an hour. So the narrative that this happened all at once, all of a sudden, 
is simply not true. And again, this is a mitigation tactic to say, well, it happened so fast that, you know, we just couldn't issue a warning in time. One of the residents we heard from, I think, from Plainfield earlier tonight said, well, we heard about a tornado warning or tore a tornado watch. First of all, there was no tornado watch or warning. That's straight up false and you cannot go on air. It's horrifically irresponsible to go on air with misinformation in a situation this dire. And I think we hear about those often enough that after a while they don't always materialize and you it's like crying wolf in a sense and you don't expect them actually to happen today we saw what did happen. It only takes one right. though, to make you a right. believer. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. Okay. This one is perhaps the most frustrating thing of all that's said. Um, this anchor says you know we heard someone say that there was a tornado watch or a tornado warning, but you know, they, I guess they didn't take it seriously. This is a bull, boy cry wolf situation to imply that the victims were just doing this whole boy, boy cry wolf situation where they've probably heard a tornado watch or warning a hundred times. And this is the one time that these people didn't take it seriously. I really don't like to use this word because I think it's often mischaracterized and overused, frankly, on the internet. But I have never actually seen gaslighting like this on a live news coverage. It's taking the victim's rightful frustration and anger or questions that they may have had and making them feel as though they weren't aware enough of what was going on around them. And that's simply not what happened. If my family or friend or myself, if I was in a situation where something like this happened and my home was destroyed by an unwanted tornado or my friend died, anyone who goes through that would be justified in having a couple questions about that. This piece was on air and we were saying yesterday at about this time you were, it was a beautiful day out and you were saying well there's about a 40 percent chance of mm -hmm. rain. There was no indication that this situation was going to take place. Well, you never can predict a tornado or we would be doing pretty good here locally Warner because uh, usually we see about 600 tornadoes. It's so upsetting to hear someone say that there's no way we could predict a tornado. Yes there is and that was the job that had to be done that day that was failed that was failed to have been done. Now, what I personally think here, and this is just my speculation, they're realizing that there was no tornado warning and that's obviously very upsetting to people. And I think in order to sort of get ahead of those angry comments or those questions or inquiries, they are mitigating the situation. To me, this seems apparent of going into immediate PR mode, if you will, to limit the noise, to limit the questions and the backlash that I think that they realized they were going to ultimately get. Now, in these next clips, we have what is some of the only clips of people who are acknowledging the lack of Morning. Well, uh, the damage that we've uh, encountered here is mainly to this nine unit uh, apartment building that uh, we found uh, seven fatalities in a cornfield uh, in a road about a half a block away. We have only a few seconds here. I'm wondering, it sounds like people were so caught unaware. Was there enough of a tornado warning? Uh, to my knowledge, there was no warning. No warning whatsoever. The last question in the very last few seconds, she says, was there enough warning? These people seem to have been caught off guard. And he says, no, no warning, no warning. Well, I was seated in a, in, in a room in this building that's immediately behind me when all of a sudden it came up without any warning and we ran for cover in a back room and some of the staff dove under uh, the tables. You, of course, knew that it was a tornado. Uh, I knew it was a tornado at the point that the roof became to, uh, ripped off. We had no warning that it was a tornado up until that time. We had no warning it was a tornado until he basically figured it out himself because the roof was coming off and he was extremely lucky to have, you know, uh, not been killed in that. The only people who are acknowledging the lack of warning for the victims are the people who are actually out in the field. These are victims themselves, like the principal who was actually pulled out of rubble, or firefighters who are 
working with victims and the search and rescue process. So it's a notable difference, the acknowledgement of a lack of warning that's coming from the victims themselves and the people who are helping the victims. And then you have the people in the news room. Given that these news segments are all literally hours after the events happened, it's interesting to me that they are so adamant on saying that they know nothing else could have been done. When in all reality, it's only been a couple hours and there's no way you could have done a full investigation on what exactly happened with the National Weather Service. The fact that they're already trying to give definitive answers to the public to minimize what happened is pretty telling to me. I headed out toward Rockford and DeKalb area and that's when the uh, first tornado was uh, reported near Pecatonica. That... Uh started moving toward the southeast and so I started watching it as it approached. Dr. Paul Savatka actually watched the tornado genesis, um, the formation of the tornado near Rockford. Paul, so I have to ask you, you uh, as, as a meteorologist, you, uh, you heard that uh, severe weather might be in the area and uh, did you actually go out looking for this? Yes, uh, <laughs> this is something that I do as, at the College of DuPage and I often take students out is that we go out storm chasing. At what point did you realize that this was a deadly, fearsome storm? Uh, at this point, when I stopped the vehicle, I pulled off the side of the road and I started looking up. And uh, I started seeing rotation within this large, larger thunderstorm. And I saw a little bit of a funnel cloud mm -hmm. starting to appear. You and did see a funnel cloud. Okay. Yeah, it was, unfortunately, it was right on top of right. me. And uh, at this point, I took off in my van and tried to head out of it. You're going to show exclusive footage of tornado genesis happening an hour before the Plainfield tornado and broadcast that. But when it comes to talking about the timely manner and the lack of tornado warning for the Plainfield storm, we want to pretend that we had no idea tornadoes were possible on this day. Frankly, I just don't buy any of those excuses. I think I'm just appalled that there was so much evidence of a possible tornado and it was just so overwhelmingly dismissed. After watching the subsequent news that came out of this event, I was really horrified. I felt it felt wrong. Um, and I genuinely couldn't believe that they aired some of these things where, where they were essentially blaming the victims for not being more aware. Man, I mean, these clips made me really mad. All right, what about Plainfield now? The rebuilding of Plainfield. Plainfield is a great example of one of the communities that did not let a tornado tragedy define them. Uh, Plainfield rebuilt. It's grown exponentially. So in 1990, the population of Plainfield was just over 5,000. Um, in 2010, the population jumped to a little over 40,000. After the tornado, Plainfield boomed. Lisa Kloss shows me around the rebuilt Plainfield Central High School, a far cry from how it looked back in August of 1990. The whole roof had come down and was piled inside the gym. Uh, there's also a tornado victim memorial in Plainfield now, which is actually right across from the new high school that was built. And it is a beautiful memorial. And 29 people lost their lives. This monument is dedicated to those who died. Less than a mile away sits St. Mary's Immaculate Church, a beautiful building filled with stained glass, the Virgin Mary and Jesus. This building itself can be considered somewhat of a resurrection. So let's talk about the improvements that have been made since this event. Outside of the obvious advancements in technology, uh, smartphones, better radars, a more educated general public, a lot of changes been, have been made in the efficacy of the warning process, as you all know. Uh, too much for me to talk about, really, but here's a few. One of the recommendations that was initially made in the report by the National Weather Service that we talked earlier was that the spotter network be improved. and. It certainly has been improved. In 1990, the National Weather Service spotter training sessions had just over a thousand people that were trained to be able to spot storms. So since then, 
The National Weather Service in Chicago trains nearly 3,000 people every year. And now in addition, radio and television have a plethora of methods of communication that have emerged to allow for almost a redundancy in communication, social media, we've got phone warnings, TV, radio, um, all sorts of different ways to get warnings. So yeah, there's been a ton of positive changes for the Chicago offices and for the National Weather Service as a whole. They are always so good at implementing effective changes. So what are the lasting implications from the Plainfield tornado event? Even today, many meteorologists will refer to the Plainfield syndrome, it's called, as the idea that it's better to issue too many warnings than to not issue a warning. At some point after the 1990 tornado, the NWS also decided to redu reduce Chicago's workload by creating multiple branches within the area. Shortly after this event, the National Weather Service in Chicago did upgrade their radars. The National Weather Service isn't perfect. They make mistakes. We have even seen some of those mistakes in the past um, little while. Overall, the National Weather Service has always done phenomenal work and they're always, as I've mentioned, phenomenal about uh, conducting these internal investigations and making sure that they own up to their mistakes and improve on them as best as possible. As I've said, the National Weather Service is by far their own biggest critic. Overall, there is no good ending to this story. Plainfield did recover, but 30 years later, people who lost their family still lost their family. It was still, at the end of the day, a tragedy. Despite the National Weather Service improving, 29 people were still killed, and we don't know how many of those people would be here today had they had a few minutes to get to a shelter. I don't really have any solidified conclusions here. It was a really anomalous, horrific tragedy. But, you know, I would love to know what you all think. And every time I talk about a tornado video, undoubtedly there's always people who let me know their personal experience. Thank you all. I am always so in awe at the comments that I get about people who have experienced these things firsthand. And I really appreciate all of them. I read through them and I'm just so thankful that you would entrust me with a personal story like that. Thank you all so much um, just for being here, for sharing your experiences with me and with everyone else. It really gives me a better understanding of what I'm talking about here. It's been 32 years now since the Plainfield tornado. I don't know that anything will ever come close to how strange this event really was, but I don't know. Wow, Blaze has been here this entire time. He's such a good boy. Look at him. Always come and say hi. That is it for today's video, guys. I really hope you all enjoyed it, and we will catch you in the next one. Bye.